In this episode, someone flashes their headlights. Rick cuts a hole in a wire fence, then goes to see a man about a dog. Hi, this is Rick. In today's episode, we will learn how to flash a car headlights or get AI to do it. We will learn how to cut fences with a pair of pliers. And we'll do some dog handling and watch AI taking dogs for a walk. So um, the story is, this is D-Day plus two. We're now heading down this little road to meet up with the French resistance leader who is going to take us to a secret German airfield, which we're going to sabotage. So the first thing we'll do is uh, we'll meet up with the resistance. So we have to meet a guy called Hugo. Okay, so get into the resistance track. Ah, welcome friends. We have been expecting you. My name is Hugo. I am the leader of the local resistance. Our objective today is at German airfield. It is approximately two kilometers to the west. If you look at your map, you will see the mark. Okay, let's go. All right. Great French accent. That, believe it or not, was made with a text-to-speech editor. Um, and uh, this guy's name is Hugo. So uh, we're going to see firstly how that was made, and then, uh, then we'll continue on to the next step. That was relatively simple to do. I have a little trigger. This and vehicle player in the list, and then it runs a little script and it passes the name of the car that's going to do the, the headlight flashing. So we come along here, we trigger it, trigger a script. This is res car. Nothing special about the setup. We have a guy called res1 and it switches off randomization of this individual so he doesn't change his clothing and this is the French resistance leader and his name is currently set to set identity Hugo and it moves him into cargo position 1 since there's no one else in the vehicle, he will be in the first cargo position and it stops him running away. <clears throat> okay, so the flash headlight script, very simple. That was the script that was run on the uh, trigger. So it says um, the car will be the select zero. So it's the first element of the array passed from the script. Number of flashes you want, four. Then it runs a simple little loop for I from one to number of flashes from one to four. Do the following. Player action, light on, car. Switches, that's instruction to switch on the lights. Sleeps for one second, switches them off. Sleeps for one second and then loops back again. It does that four times. And then it exits the loop and that's the end. So this is extremely simple. Okay, so that's how we flash the car headlights. So now having um, 
met the resistance, we then travel to the recon position, just marked as once the trigger is triggered. And it's triggered with task four complete. So once we've finished task four, this task is triggered. I'll just show you what the, the trip to the airfield recon position looks like. This is a, a little area on the left. I've used the grass cutter large, the big square one. It removes most of the grass, not surprisingly. And then I put some haystacks down, um, which is quite, quite nice. Looks cool. A couple of large haystacks. So we get past, past these guys and we head down to the airfield. So I need to trigger the uh, section and I'm going to set myself as a captive. Let's wait for the task to propagate. There we go. One of the advantages of public variables and using a mission setup where you trigger each subsequent uh, section or objective with a public variable is that it's very modular and it allows you to check a specific task uh, and all of the scripting functions within that area rather than have multiple interconnected trigger activated uh, conditions and so on which makes it really tough to uh, debug a mission. Or if it was completely scripted as well. Spend so much time writing debugging conditions and to get the mission ready. So I'm just going to get rid of my group because I don't really actually want them. delete all my AI that are with me. Oh, exit vehicle. Forgot about that. Cursor target. It sounds like a sticker. Yeah. So it looks like a sticker has found me. turned out to be, or supposed to be, a clandestine mission. It's turned into a bit of a disaster. So now I'm going to cut the fence. Um, tricky part of cutting, cutting a fence, or cutting the fence animation, is that there is no, <coughs> excuse me, uh, there's no cutting fence animation that's really suitable. So I a pair of pliers in his hand. Um, I'm doing it in slow motion at the moment, but it, it's about as close as I can get it. Given that his hand orientation is slightly off. Um, anyway, and then what happens is that once the fence has been cut and collapsed, uh, it then gets deleted and the pliers get removed from his hand. So I'll show you how that works in the script. The two different types of fence that we're going to cut just now. This fence or various parts of the fence have got this little add action applied to it. And this add action calls this script that we're looking at now called cutfence.sqf, which is in the scripts folder. First thing it says to cut the fence, you need to be within less than three meters. So that prompt comes up um, when you are within sort of three and a half meters of the fence. So you get close to the fence, it then pulls an object from this select zero, it then creates some pliers, creates a vehicle position player, it attaches it to the left hand, which is a attach point, 
and then it sets a slight offset. It sleeps for a second and then it runs a while loop. Condition of the while loop to run is that the player is less than three and a half meters from the fence and he is alive. So this is play, play action now, put down. That's about as close as I can get to something that looks remotely like he's cutting, leaning forward and extending his hand and doing something. Uh, it sleeps for a second, then plays uh, remote, remote execs a say 3D cut sound. Uh, the player is the object that the sound is played on, it plays the sound cut, and it remote, ex remote execs that, sends it to all the players on the network. If you're within range, you'll hear me cutting. It then sets damage to the object. It adds 0 0.2 to the damage on each loop. Sleeps for 1.5 seconds, and then it checks to see if the damage is greater than 0 0.8. And then basically, once the fence has uh, been damaged sufficiently, it will collapse automatically on its own. So we, we kind of almost want it to be deleted at the exact moment that it collapses, rather than collapse and then be deleted and, and have an, a noticeable delay. All right, so that's that fence. So I'm going to fast forward now to the next fence, which is over there. Since I'm captive, I hope they don't shoot me. I don't think they will. So I'm going to just teleport myself up to the fence. I suppose I should make it look as though I'm trying not to be seen. Okay, so in this case the fence is a slightly different fence. Okay, so we have um, an add action on the fence, which runs cut fence 2. Um, the fence is this select 0. When you're within four meter radius, it comes uh, or distance, it gives you a a hint which tells you you need to be within three of the three meters of the fence. Fence is picked up. The actual fence name is picked up from this this select zero. It then looks for the the damaged fence because if you notice the the fence that we're looking at is actually now completely cut in half so it's obviously a separate a different fence so what we've done what i've done is i've layered the i've hidden the damaged fenced object which is this object i've i've placed that in the editor and i've hidden it so what it does is it looks it looks for the nearest object to the fence and it looks for this object and if it finds that object it should only find one because there's essentially one for each of these fence objects because we needed to know what the damaged object was called so that we can unhide it and remove the fence otherwise we just remove the fence and the the tricky part with this particular fence is that or these fences is that when you damage them when you do a set damage one on them they actually fall over they don't they don't just disappear they tip backwards and so on so it's not it's not ideal we need to get rid of it before it actually falls over because that looks really weird. Okay, so then we create some pliers like we did in the previous uh, script. We attach the pliers to the left hand and the slight offset. Sleep for one second and then run a while loop. Okay. Player add, player action now, put down, sleep for a second, play the sound, remote exec, say 3D on the player, play the sound, cut. Then we apply damage to the fence on each on each loop of 0 0.2. So we take the damage, the current damage of the fence, and we add 0 0.2 to it. When it gets damage equals one, it's 100% damaged. In other words, it should be destroyed. 
sleep 1.5 and then it waits till the damage is greater than or equal to 0 0.8 in fact this should have been greater than or equal to actually let's just say this Okay, so if damage uh, damage fence is greater than or equal to 0 0.8, then it exits the script with the following. Uh, fence D, which is the one we picked up as the nearest object to the original fence, hide, hide object false. In other words, it's already hidden, so we now unhide it. Sleeps for 0 0.4 seconds, deletes the fence, the original fence, the perfectly undamaged fence, detaches the pliers, deletes the pliers, removes the hint, which says stand within three meters of the fence. So that's how the cut fence works. Obviously, the put down animation isn't 100% great and the pliers, attaching the pliers to the hand and his hand movement and the orientation of the pliers as his hand moves is not 100% either, but it's kind of as close as I can get it. It looks okay, it's not great. All right, so, Right now, the next thing is we're going to go and see a man about a dog. So you notice that there's a guy running here with a dog. And he's got the dog like sort of on a very tight leash. Which is really tricky to do because dogs generally don't like that. Especially in Armour 3 where they have the IQ of a small stone or brick. You see that he's switching animation as well and speed. There's a couple of little like slight hesitations in the animation. And part of that is that I can't quite figure out the exact length of the animation. And the reason I need the length of the animation is as follows. Okay. Now the thing that you have to understand with a dog is that it's a, it's a essentially not the most well in I'm, I'm not saying about dogs in real real life because i'm a i'm a dog lover and they're certainly a lot cleverer than most people but in armor three the dogs as i said are have an iq sort of not much greater than a brick so um it's a real problem especially when you're trying to get them to do things like just walk or run from one position to another so if this script is not running on the server exit so I pick up the handler, I run the script or call the script with this. I put it on the handler of the dog. So it picks up the handler, excuse the pun. It's kind of a little scripting joke, as in handle. Anyway, so um, handler, this select zero. So it picks up the name, it picks up the object that's got the dog. It then spawns a dog, creates an agent, Alsatian same black F gets pos handler can collide and creates the object. It then very importantly disables the animal behavior. Um, if you don't, the dog sort of runs around in circles and rotates and just generally looks completely retarded. Um, so we set variable biz funk animal behavior disable to true. So the dog then, essentially, uh, from what I understand, that's if there is an FSM running on the dog, it basically disables the FSM. So I think it would probably be a bit similar to disable AI FSM, something like that. Anyway, so then it then now this is the interesting bit. I I found that if I attach the dog to the handler with a slight offset, I kind of got the most. General, re generally more realistic effects than I did if you do an alternative way, which is down here. Um, the drawback of this method is that obviously when he, if he pauses to shoot or so on, uh, I've still got to work out how to get the dog to switch into a, a freestanding animation while the German soldier, the handler, is attempting to fight off the enemy. The other alternative would just be in the event that there's like a maybe putting an event handler, a fired event handler onto the, the handler. And when he does that to detach the dog and just let the dog sort of wander off into the distance. Uh, it's not ideal. 
It certainly looks more realistic if you want to just see a dog handler walking with a dog next to him. It looks, it looks a hell of a lot better than the alternative. The alternative is the following loop. And this little loop here, let me just switch off this comment. So the following loop does the following. Excuse the pun. It spawns us into the non-scheduled environment. So it passes the dog and the handler to the non-scheduled environment. It declares them as a first and second variables in the array. So the dog then plays dog walk. And then while the live dog do checks the distance, kind of not necessary. I was playing with this. So I can get take that comment out to try and trigger the dog to switch into different animation states. And I can move him, I can move him up from dog walk to dog run to dog sprint. But then I can't seem to, for some reason, slow him down back to dog walk again. I'm not quite sure why. I tried switch move, play move, play move now. And he, I could switch him, as I said, upwards from dog walk to dog run to dog sprint. But I couldn't get him to slow down again. I'm not quite sure why. Anyway, so the dog, in this particular case, the dog, it uses a, a low level command, move to. So it tells the dog to move to get Paz handler. So essentially, and then it waits for half a second and it just keeps doing this while the dog is alive. The problem with this is that if the handler sprints off into the distance, then the dog seems to kind of sometimes lose track of where the handler is and he just runs around in circles. <laughs> so that, I don't think there's a perfect solution, to be honest, at the moment. As, as the, unless Bohemia do something significant to, to improve the, the intelligence or, or maybe the FSM, the amount of processing that dogs have. I think dogs should be given a special higher status of processing in the game. I mean, sheep, I can understand, and chickens maybe, you know, they can have the IQ of a brick, but I think a, a dog deserves a little bit better, especially because dogs can play quite a cool role in missions as far as uh, barking, triggering a defense system and so on. So I think especially in the, like we're playing, this is Iron Front 3, this in case you hadn't worked that out. So we're in a Second World War environment and German patrol dogs and so on, and, and maybe even Americans using patrol dogs would also be really cool. So I just think that um, they could do something with that, but I think it's a bit late now, maybe in Armour 4. Anyway, so going back to the original attach to command and the method of that, that I used, I think it kind of looks pretty good. If I shoot the guy, then the dog goes into a sit position straight away and he will just sit there. And that's kind of cool because, it, you know, dogs are man's best friend and probably the most loyal creatures on the planet. So, you know, it's kind of sad to see him sitting there. And at this point, we will break into tears. Anyway, so I hope that was of use to you <laughs> and see you again soon. Please click like and, and uh, su subscribe if this was useful. Cheers.